our webinar. And share the welcome slide. And hopefully people will start arriving. Yes, I can see them beginning to come. This has been a very popular topic, Susan. So I'm expecting quite high numbers. I suppose it's a bit less theoretical, isn't it? Than well, everyone's got heating. That's the thing. Everyone's got heating. Yes. Whereas some of them, like EV car charging, is more, you know, that's going to be of interest to a proportion of people. But everyone wants to know how to heat their church. They do. Hello, <laughs> everyone who's gathering. Please do, as you gather, find the uh, find the chat box and put in there your your name and your role, where in the country you're coming from. Let people know who you are. I certainly always find it very interesting to see where everyone is joining from. Oh, and Richard has put in the put in the chat box. Heating is very current too, which is. Absolutely correct. Here's Wendy, who I met a couple of weeks ago. I will do your report very shortly. Got Suffolk, Leeds, Basingstoke, Salisbury, Sheffield, Oxford Diocese, Canterbury, all around the country. Hello, Godfrey joining from Coventry, some familiar names. I wonder if I wonder if Kathy will be our most northerly person joining from Bellingham in Northumberland. You really feel at the hub of something, don't you, Susan, as you watch all the names and locations come. That's right. Oh. The, um, quite a few people I know from my own diocese, which is great. Thank you, folks, <laughs> for support. We've still got a got three minutes to go, so thank you to everyone who's here so promptly. But I'll let people gather until we get to to noon before I'll kick us off. Is it sunny where you are today, Susan? Very, Worcester is lovely today, I have to say. Um, so um, it's very nice to um, to be here. Um, I've had to sort of, I've got the sun behind me, so hopefully everybody can see me. You look very clear to me. Oh, hello, Alex from the Church in Wales. Good to see you here. If you've just joined, uh, whilst we wait for it to turn noon, if you can find the chat box and put your your name and role in there, it's always lovely to see where everyone's gathering from. I just wish I could see you all in person. It's, um, webinars are all right, but I just did it's so one of these days soon I hope we can actually um, speak to people in in person again. Well, the the Zoom, Zoom has been amazing though. Um, Joe and I spoke last night at a meeting called by the Diocesan and Environment Officer for the Diocese of Europe and we had 40 people everywhere from Norway to Turkey south of France right across Europe all gathering together on Zoom in the same room as it were and you think before that would have been unthinkable. Would, and if you be, think of the carbon footprint of trying to gather everybody physically. That is true. That is very true. 
It's, um, no, that is really good. It, it does do that. It opens it up, doesn't it? Mm. I find it's very, it's a very good replacement for things like this, which are at conveying information. It doesn't replace the, the richness of discussion. Um, yeah if you're trying to join in as a group or generate ideas or something. But I think for something like this, it's been a, a revelation. Yes, yes, it is. I, I mean, I've done a lot of um, conferences and presenting in my time and I do feed off the audience, but you know, it, it's, it's still, as you say, it's really got the, um, it's good for this type of, of approach for sure. Yeah. Right, we're up to 150 people. Wow. And it's turned noon, so let me start the recording. Oh, it's already going, so I don't need to do that. And uh, start going with the introductions. So welcome, everybody. You're here for our webinar on choosing the right heating system. Uh, you probably know Susan's running two webinars for us. This is the second on choosing the right heating system. The first was on to replace or not to replace. So hopefully some of you will already have been to that initial one. If not, don't worry. Uh, Susan's running both topics again two more times. I always begin with my preview of upcoming attractions. So we have got a real focus on heating in the next few weeks. So we've got two more dates of church heating to replace or not replace, and two more dates of this one that you're here at today on choosing the right heating system. So if you get to the end of this session and think, oh, I really wish that my, my colleague had been here, don't worry. Uh, firstly, they'd be able to catch the video when the recording goes up on our website, but also there are two more dates that they can come along to. We've also got another run of the webinar by Bruce Kirk on church lighting and how you can use that for energy efficiency and moving your church towards net zero. And then also a trailer for the fact that at the beginning of June, we're having a whole series focusing on land and nature to tie in with Churches Count on Nature Week. So during that week, we've got 12 different webinars with an incredible range of topics, all themed around land and nature. And I'll put the links to that in the chat once we get going. Uh, today, with so many attendees, we will be doing using the Q&A function for your questions rather than the chat. So please do put any questions that you have into the Q&A. A few people have emailed me questions in advance, but actually with this large an audience, I think it's really important that if you've got a question, you put it into the Q&A, because then that allows everybody to, to click the thumbs up next to the question that they would most like to hear answered, and the questions with the most thumbs up, go to the top, and that's where we'll focus Susan's time when we get to the end of her slides. We're recording the talk today so that uh, the recording can go onto the website, and after we finish, I'll send you the slides and a link through to our feedback form, and also any links that get shared in the chat. Right. The, the, the main event, uh, Susan Logan has come to speak to us today and you are in very safe hands. Susan knows a huge amount about church heating, 40 years advising on energy efficiency and carbon efficient solutions, 13 years as the heating advisor for Worcester DAC. Uh, without any further ado, if I stop sharing my screen and hand over to you, Susan, to share your screen and lead us off. Okay, Doug, let's just make sure we're on the right screen. We're on the right screen. That looks perfect to me. Good. Okay, Dogs. Well, welcome everybody, and, and what a privilege to have so many people um, interested in this topic. Um, and it is a very salient topic. Um, and as Catherine said before, everybody's got heating of one sort or another, well, hopefully. Um, and I, in this talk, what I really want to do is um, type two things. One is to talk about what makes us comfortable, but what makes us comfortable in the context of a, a net zero carbon future. And it's 
not easy, um, which I guess is why there's so many people listening to this. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to give you the perfect answer. I can't give you the perfect answer. But what I can do, and I hope to do in the, in the course of this, this short talk, really, is to give you a roadmap to um, how you can go about these things and, and how you can start making some good decisions for, for the future. So without further ado, um, straight in there. Maybe it advances one. Okay, so there we go. So the first thing that we're gonna go through is, is, is a bit, little bit of a roadmap. Um, what do we need? What are the principles we should be adhering to? And then into two, more technical sections, which hopefully I can make accessible to all of you. Um, how to choose a heat source and then how to choose a heating system. Um, the last two sections will be longer than, than the first two. Um, and then we're going to go into some, into some detail about how, um, what's available out there and what the advantages and disadvantages are. And you will be able to obviously get this um, seminar and the slides at the end. So um, it won't be necessary to take lots and lots of notes. Um, this will be available and there's, there's quite a lot of technical detail. And in doing this, um, I have drawn on um, Catherine's Heating Principles papers that are also available on the Church of England website. Um, and we've, uh, you know, and, and used some of the principles there um, to, to look at, but the principles that I would use anyway in the course of, of my work as a heating advisor. So first of all, needs. Now, um, I did a lot of um, discussion on needs on the first seminar, so I'm not gonna take up too much time on this one. Um, all I've done here right now is just to put the headings of the previous seminar. And I would, if you haven't listened to that one and you're thinking about replacing your heating system, I would, I would recommend that you go and get that seminar and, and work through the, the early part of that what we need now, what we might need in the future, how building changes affect heating, so reordering and extensions and taking pews out and how all of that will affect our heating system, um, whether the heating system itself can be adapted or whether it's time to replace it because it's not adaptable to our new needs. Um, the needs of the building are historic, um, our historic building stock and, and what we need to preserve that as well, how you might go about planning and funding it and, and also moving towards lower carbon. That really is, is a, just a, a very, very quick pricey of what we talked about last time um, in the previous seminar. Um, so um, I won't go into that um, in too much detail, except to emphasize that planning is essential um, in, in getting towards the, the goals we need. And also we um, covered last time, but it's worth, I think, just recapping slightly is what can we afford? Because um, when we're thinking about choosing a system, affordability has got to come into it. We, we, you know, we can't um, stick our heads in the um, zero carbon sand and say affordability is irrelevant, it isn't. Um, I obviously working with um, churches, I understand that uh, finances are limited. Sometimes it doesn't come in a uniform way. Grants have to be applied for. Um, and sometimes crises happen. Um, so, in terms of affordability, before we even think about what we're gonna choose, we, we do need to think what, whether we are planning for the future. Have we got a fund for our heating system? Have we got a plan for replacement and upgrade? Long-term plan for carbon reduction? And can we take action in the short term while we work out a longer term plan? But the, the big message here is don't leave it too late because once, um, a church is in a situation where there is a failure 
of a heating system. Then, and the funding isn't there to support the replacement, then the choices are inevitably more limited. And so it's really important to have a long-term strategy. In the past, um, heating systems and boilers, um, heating systems, you know, I come across regularly that are 100 years old and they might have a bit of life left in them. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, I have had a couple recently where I've had to go and say this heating system is, is basically worn out, um, which is unfortunate. Um, boilers, the older style boilers would last for many years, not very efficiently, but they would last for a long time and, and modern boilers probably nothing like as much uh, inefficiency, we, we lose a bit in longevity, of course. So don't leave it too late to, to make your plans. So that was a very quick canter through the previous seminar. So we're, we're going now into the um, principles of low carbon heating. Um, basic principles of carbon in heating. So the first thing by far is that we should not consume any more than we have to. How, we'll, we'll come into a little bit of detail how that might happen. Um, but no matter how low your carbon source, if it's using any carbon, and indeed if it's um, using embodied carbon and putting it in in the first place, it should be as small as possible. So we, we want to be treading lightly on this planet. Our demand should be reduced. And that, that goes for the whole of the carbon agenda, really. Um, the less we consume, the better it is. The less waste is produced, the less carbon is produced. And that all of that is it applies equally to, to heating. When we have reduced our demand as, as much as we can, then we should only supply ideally exactly what we need. That never quite works in, in the heating practice, of course. Um, there's always efficiencies, there's always wastage, but as near as possible, we should make sure that our supply should equal our demand. That's about controls, it's about delivering heat to where people are. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. So when we've minimized our demand, when we've minimized the amount of supply we need to meet that demand, then we should be looking at the lowest possible carbon source. And, and that isn't necessarily the lowest possible carbon source. That could be the lowest possible carbon source that is available to us, that is practical to use, that is controllable. So um, when we come out of this, the one thing I will tell you at the end, I will tell you now, there is no one solution. There's no right answer. There's a whole lot of right answers. And, and that's where the, um, where this seminar really is going um, in more detail um, to look at what sort of answers there could be for you, for your church, for your diocese, and maybe even at home too, because I guess most of you have homes. So um, this, the, the, the same principles will, will apply domestically, although a slightly different application. So reducing demand, what does that mean in practice? Um, very practically, insulate where you can. Um, now, one of the, um, I show there on the pictures, um, the church being re-roofed, and that is, um, there are certain key triggers where you can insulate, uh, where you've got access. Obviously, um, insulation is a, um, a complex topic because there is always the possibility of condensation and therefore um, your architect um, is key in advising on this. But um, where there is an opportunity to insulate um, when you're re-roofing, um, that is always a really good time to think about it. Obviously, when you're extending then, um, or building anything new, then the insulation should be as good as it can be. Um, passive house standards of insulation um, basically create a building where it, it virtually needs no heating input at all. And obviously that, that can be encouraged, but um, I guess the majority of us are sitting in, in older buildings um, where there is a heat loss and, and there is limited opportunity. 
one of the most common questions I get answered is about double glazing. Well, it's a bit of a vexed topic, but the, the reality is that um, double glazing is not a practical solution for the majority of historic windows. Um, although it can it, it can be reduced, drafts are probably a bigger issue, um, and that can be addressed through um, good draft sealing and Im improving um, how the window fits into the into the opening. Another big um, area of drafts, and I'll show it in the bottom um, right hand corner. Hopefully, it is 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 our old faithful the um, the cast iron floor duct. Um, we come; they're very very common now. The Victorians were wonderful engineers. Uh, when, their, when our Victorian or Victorian refurbished churches were created, they would be packed with people. People give off heat. Um, people also um, need ventilation to breathe. There would be people packed in. I mean, the one church I used to go to was designed to seat 1,500 people, um, probably about a maximum of 150 regularly worshipped there. So everything's changed and these floor ducts were created to provide ventilation for um, hygiene purposes and also to, to deal with the fumes from gas lighting. You don't need them anymore. You need some, but you don't need them. So they're a really good source to start looking at whether there's a lot of uncontrolled air coming in, in through them. There'll probably be a corresponding vent in the roof as well. And you can lose a lot of energy that way. Using space wisely is another major, major thing. So um, whilst it, you know, uh, it, it is obviously part of our mission and our delight, delight to worship in a, a large space um, that is created for it, there may be um, spaces we can use in our church for smaller meetings, for intimate gatherings, for um, business meetings and for uh, other activities, which are much, much smaller, so we don't have to heat the huge space. So that again is going to reduce our demand. And we can, it's often quite useful to look at hybrid heating solutions. So you can just turn on heat where you need it for us in a smaller space. Particularly where we're using a church seven days a week, um, it may well be far more useful to use a church centre or a church hall for that type of activity. Next, we deliver heat where it's needed, and this is where keeping people warm, which is usually what we want to do. Um, sometimes we need to keep the fabric warm, and sometimes we need to preserve, preserve the fabric and artefacts, but in general, and we want to keep the people that are meeting warm and warm enough as well. It's part of our mission to make people feel welcome and comfortable in our spaces and heating is, is fundamental to that. And we, so we don't want to be putting heat in where it's wasted. I often get asked about um, stratification and, and warm air rising. Yes, it does. And in some ways you can't entirely eliminate that. But what you can do is try and get it to um, the, the spaces that you need it. So then we want to think about supply equaling demand. With renewables, we generally want to keep the size of the system down um, because we, we don't want it to do the peak load. So very often uh, a renewable system um, works best at about 50% capacity, possibly topped up by something else. We want to heat where we need it, we've already talked about. We want to control and zone um, our heating system so that it delivers heat to where we need it um, and not where we don't need it at, at times in the week. Um, a, vexed, a bit of a vexed topic is to whether run continuously or not. Um, some um, churches do work much better with their heating run at a, a steady level topped up. Um, and don't use any more carbon doing that. It will kind of depend on the thermal mass. It's a bit of a specialist topic, really. Certainly modern buildings, um, well-insulated well buildings do not need to run continuously. Um, 
some systems do so under floor heating which we'll, we'll talk about a bit later that generally does need to run continuously so and again it's the answer is it kind of depends it, it isn't one size fits all and whether if you do decide to think about running continuously i always recommend taking a meter reading at the start take a meter reading at the finish monitor it and compare it to running continuously or not continuously so you've got some accurate data about how much energy you're using. Right, so what is low carbon heating source? Um, so carbon is measured in kilogram CO2, that's equivalent. Um, other things have more carbon than carbon dioxide, but we, we measure it for convenience in, in, in CO2. Um, so for example, um, Refrigerant gases have a much higher CO2 equivalent than carbon dioxide. But what comes out of a, a boiler flue is, is mostly carbon dioxide. So we, for convenience, we use this. So what's the lowest? Well, um, in terms of emissions, photovoltaic panels or PV, uh, wind and solar are always going to be zero carbon in terms of the emissions in operation. Biomass comes next. It kind of depends where it comes from, but, but generally it comes next. Heat pumps come after that because they have electricity that goes into them. Electricity itself has got a carbon implication. You can reduce carbon heat pumps to near zero carb by using a, a green tariff, a true green tariff. But they come there um, on my graph where supplied by um, average UK grid electricity. Gas comes next. Now electricity is changing all the time. So this is last year's figures and in a couple of years time, electricity is gonna look different. Gas is still fairly stable at the moment. Um, that might change depending on what the government decide to do in terms of greening the gas grid. More of that in, in a bit. Liquid petroleum gas, color gas, as it's known, um, and all the um, gas derivatives from the oil, from oil, because that's what it is, um, comes next. Not um, an electricity currently, slightly more than that, but it, the electricity will very quickly um, come down and is already at times of the year as well below liquid petroleum gas. And then gas oil, um, there are various types of oil. There's, there's kerosene burning oil, gas oil. They're, they're all about the same in terms of carbon. Um, you, you may be burning slightly different things if you have an oil supply in your church, but um, they're all around the same on, um, in carbon terms. And so uh, the possibility of greener gas or hydrogen in the future, and hydrogen itself has a very variable carbon profile. It depends how it's generated. So carbon, um, hydrogen generated from pure renewable sources is very low carbon. Um, in the middle comes um, blue hydrogen, um, which is generated from gas. And, and then there's much higher high car, um, hydrogen, which is generated from other sources. I won't go into that in too much detail right now. So, um, UK electricity is already getting lower. You can purchase true green electricity now, and I've put there the parish um, purchasing basket um, for um, where you can look at the um, true green electricity that's available through that scheme. And biomass is of course possible in some locations. Right, with no further ado, because we need to get on with this heat source. So what to choose? As a principle, the lowest carbon source for the life of the system, that's important. So how long is the life of the system? The answer to that is, for, is, is actually complicated. Um, are we a church that's got a long-term future that is growing and needing um, a solution for the next 20 years? Are we a bit less certain of that? Have we got a system which is probably 
got a five to 10 years. So it's a really complex one. So number one, what is the life of our system? So these are the questions. What fuel do we have now? Um, if we're in a town, we've probably got gas and electricity available to us. Um, if we're uh, out in a rural parish, we probably have oil, biomass and LPG available to us as well as electricity. Uh, what fuel could be used in the future? And that again depends on where we are. Big, a big question when we're talking about heat pumps and renewables is do we have single or three phase electricity? Uh, because single phase electricity can really limit our options. Not, don't make them impossible, it just makes it more difficult. And three phase electricity gives us a lot more options. And what is the capacity of our, our system? What's available? How is it delivered? Um, I mean, for example, um, have you got a very long route to between the road and the church? Um, how does anything such as biomass or oil get there? Are we replacing the heating system or are we just replacing the heating source? If we're replacing the heating system, we've got a lot more options than just replacing the source. What temperatures can the system work at? Most systems, you know, designed at 80 degrees C, 70 degrees C, um, but obviously more modern systems may well be designed at lower temperatures. What space do we have to put things? Um, where can we put things? Can we put, you know, have we got space in the churchyard? Have we got space in the building? And as before, what can we afford or get funding for? A lot of questions there, but it is, hopefully that's a bit of a, um, again, a roadmap to thinking about what we can do. So what are our heat sources available? And, and the next section is, is really just this is what is out there. I'm not saying it's everything it's out that's out there. There, there are other things. Um, and it, you know, I may well get questions on other things that are out there, but this is the majority, the, the common things that are available to the majority of churches. So we have heat pumps that get their heat from the air. We have heat pumps that get their heat from the ground. So soil. We have heat pumps that get their heat from water. Um, so those are the three main headings for um, heat pumps. Uh, we'll come back and we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail as we do. So here we are, um, a heat pump to a wet system. So a wet system is one of those that uses hot water through radiators, fan convectors, underfloor heating, etc. So we're taking heat out of the air and we're putting it into water. It works on electricity. Um, many churches will need a three-phase supply for anything like a decent size heat pump. Um, domestically, you don't, um, but once you start getting bigger, you, you probably will need a three-phase supply um, because of the characteristics of the um, compressors that are in, in the system. Important to note, it does use refrigerant gas, so it's not without its impact. Um, Roughly, you get somewhere between two and a half times to four times the heat out for one kilowatt in. So every kilowatt electrically you put in at about, you know, somewhere like 14 to 20 pence a unit, you get um, two and a half to four times a unit. So, so you can get up to 80 pence worth of, of heat out for 20 pence of electricity in, in very rough terms. That varies through the year with some heat pumps. Um, if you've got a ground source or a water source, it's steady throughout the year. If you've got an air source, it varies with the outside temperature and that's important to note. There are gas hybrids available um, where you can um, have most of the year you work on your heat pump and when that can't work, then the gas takes over and that, that can be a, a useful um, solution. You can also uh, match these up with some controls to existing or, or new gas boilers as well. So a uh, heat pumps to where to what system? Where does the heat come from? Well, air to air comes from the air. Um, it is less efficient. The big thing to, to um, be aware with an air to air heat pump is that sometimes when it's cold, you're virtually working on one-to-one. -one. 
but at other times you're working on maybe five, four or five to one. So it averages out over the year. So when the treasurer has a complete and utter panic about the amount of electricity that's going into an air to heat, air heat pump um, in December, you have to say, yeah, but it, it's going to be a lot better in March and it will pay back. Um, the water is could be boreholes, buried coils in water, rivers, lakes, geothermal. They, these are less common applications, of course, for churches. But don't discount it. There's a lot of work going on, um, particularly in the northeast on flooded mine shafts, for example, um, where there's actually warm water sources. Um, and it may be that you know there are, there are there are viable sources that that you could have. Um, even on a possibly a village or community level. All of them work better when they're linked to a photovoltaic source, of course, because the electricity you're putting in is coming from a zero carbon source. And here's a few pictures. So the, the top left hand one um, is what the digging looks like when you're putting a horizontal coil in. And as you can see, even for that house there, there's quite a lot of it. And that can be a real limiting factor, particularly when you're talking about um, having graveyards um, and um, in many cases, churches have um, ancient, scheduled ancient monuments or archeology span that is, is um, in close proximity to the building. So that's a real limiter. Um, but the bottom left-hand corner um, shows you a borehole which is looking a lot more viable because it's taking up a lot less dug space, if you like. The middle gives you just a flavour for what the um, engineering looks like on um, heat pumps. You've got cylinders where your water is stored because you need to buffer the demand. And the big picture on the right hand is, is, is what um, air source looks like from the outside. So that's the um, the bit that takes the air in and puts it through the refrigerant coil. So a few more choices. So that was the air to water. And we'll come back on a summary on that in a bit. But we can also take the air and put it into air. And, and this is a, um, a very viable possibility for smaller churches. There's a bit of a visual impact um, because what you're basically putting into your church is something that looks like a commercial air conditioning unit as per the, the middle picture and this basically um, you can you can link a few of these indoor units to one outdoor unit um, but basically you've got refrigerant and um, cables going to an indoor unit it takes heat from outside and puts it through um, and blows warm air. Um, it can, of course, blow cold air sometimes if you want it to, but most churches don't really want the cold air. But, you know, of course, in commercial applications, you, you, you may well do. Um, reasonably efficient, um, about three or four times heat out for one kilowatt. And if you can put it with a PV, it, it, it could work for you. It's not to be discounted at all. It's a rather blurry picture on the top um, is showing the, the sort of impact you might have in a, in a historic church where you've got the cables running along, which isn't perhaps so good. It's um, with all of these, I pause in the middle to say everything is likely to need faculty. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the DAC will always consider the visual impact on, on a listed building in particular. So you need to think about where things go. And then we move on to our, um, the most common thing that you will encounter, which is a boiler. Uh, we're all familiar with boilers, uh, high temperatures. You can um, put them on the back of most of wet heating systems, relatively low cost. Why not? Well, most are currently not low carbon and it can lock you into a high carbon source particularly oil boilers, for a substantial period of time. So this is not a no, but it's a think about. Um, particularly, and this is coming back onto this, the topic of really um, where you've got to make a choice in an emergency when you've had a crisis. Th this is where we, we need really to be thinking before that crisis happens. So I've put together um, a number of 
spreadsheets really of, of advantages and disadvantages. I haven't got the time now to go into them in great detail, but hopefully it's a good reference source. So we're going to just have a canter through these. You can read what's on the screen. So gas available, lower cost at the moment, might not be a lower cost in the future, low cost to install. It has a moderate carbon impact at present, but it might get better, we don't know. It depends what the government decide to do if they decide to uh, make the gas grid greener by inserting biogas into it. Biogas on its own um, is a very niche matter at present. Um, you, you might, I mean, if you happen to have a church next door to a farm that is producing biomass, you, biogas, sorry, you might just have a source, but it's unlikely. So I'm not going to go into too much um, detail on that. Um, sorry, it's really forward, forward, too forward. Hydrogen, big topic at the moment, much hyped. It's not really available right now. It, it's um, the latest I've seen is that pure hydrogen networks are more likely to be a local network in selected areas, a bit like district heating. So you might get it, you might not. What you can do though, is get a boiler, which is very easy to convert just, just in case. And I would always recommend that, but we don't know right now. Um, hydrogen could be incredibly expensive. Again, we don't know, um, as I mentioned before, how it's produced uh, will depend. There are already out there, um, for example, there is a little um, hydrogen fuel cell CHP unit that Weizmann do that produces hydrogen from natural gas within itself. Um, very expensive, very technical, but, but it's there and, and it, we, these are going to um, increase in the future. Electricity, you all know about electricity. It can be a low carbon option on a green tariff. It could be a good solution for smaller and frequently used churches. No flues can come off PV, although you're unlikely to get enough PV to um, use for a whole heating um, system because you need a lot of it, particularly in, in, in winter. High running costs. Electricity is still expensive. Gas is still generally under four pence a unit, electricity is nearly always in excess of 12. So three times the cost as a bare minimum. Um, but obviously that is part paid for if you go for heat pumps where you're getting more than um, one to one kilowatt hours out of it. Liquid petroleum gas, we touched on before, so available to rural areas. Um, high carbon and cost, it's a byproduct of oil and gas. Oil, the same. The future of LPG and oil is looking less promising. Oil boilers are beginning to be phased out. Um, coal is already being phased out. So if you've got oil, it's, this is time to have a think about it. It's, the fuel cost is volatile. It may get taxed in the future. It has a tank which is vulnerable to theft. There is a risk of pollution if it leaks as well. So um, a lot of thought needs to be going into replacing oil. And biomass, well, um, it's available to rural areas. Um, it, has, um, it has air quality issues. There are particulates um, which are very unhealthy, which come from a biomass flu. You can get rid of some of them by burning very efficiently. But we are now starting to see with the air quality crisis we have in a lot of our cities that biomass is less likely to be a good source. It's a very high cost to install. It needs uh, quite a lot of maintenance, but I wouldn't ever discount it for a rural community, particularly if you've got a local source of bio biomass and you've got an enthusiastic um, congregation. It is still low carbon. Um, and it should always be part of the, the thought process. Um, quick slide, I'm not going to um, linger on this too long, but boilers die in bad spaces. Um, also, 
people do need to be safe. A lot of boilers are in dungeons. Um, a lot of boilers aren't safe. Um, a lot of boilers don't have water. And, and there, are, there is still a problem with asbestos. So um, quick audit of your, where your heating system is, um, is always worthwhile when you're looking at your heat source. Where is it now? Is that suitable? And where could it go in the future? And electricity, we, we've already talked about in terms of where it comes from. And increasingly our electricity is coming from uh, renewable sources. So when we're making a choice with electricity, we need to think about our supply. How big is it? How much could it do? How big is our church? What's our wiring like? And whether we can get PV. Wiring can be a big obstacle. If our wiring is of the older type, which looks like a, a copper tube, um, which has mineral inside it, uh, that can mean that, we, we, that it could be breaking down. Um, some older wiring definitely needs um, replacing. So before, one of the very common things I say to churches before I even get into the conversation about what heating source we use is what's your wiring like? Have you got an up-to-date electrical inspection? And do we need to think about that? Because that can increase our costs substantially. And I've talked before about um, single phase and three phase. In layman's terms, of course, you get about three times the amount of electricity for a three phase supply than you do for a single phase in, in very, I'm sure there's some electrical engineers out there howling, but um, that, that's the easy way of remembering it. And electricity can limit, very big churches can be limited um, because you just don't have enough electricity available to you. What else have we got? Well, you know, for the small rural churches, do not discount the wood burning stove as a, as a, um, a source of heat. Um, chances are your church was heated something like that picture um, at times gone by. Yes, you did have to put a bench in front of it to stop anybody getting too close to it, but it, it, it is a possibility. Um, solar thermals are a bit of a niche for heating hot water and of course our PV, which, can, which we've mentioned a few times already. I want to get on then for the, the last bit of this, um, which I haven't got too much time for because it's a big topic, is our heating system itself. Questions, do we need to protect users from high temperatures? Is equipment likely to be damaged? So we need to think about safety um, before we go too far. Um, so, um, and that again can dictate what we what we do in terms of our heat system. So what you might do for um, an application where you've got a crash or a vulnerable people might be quite different to what we do um, where we, we've got a, a more controlled environment. The choices, here we go, electric. So here are our choices, radiant heating, storage and panels, under pew, pew cushions, and fan assisted heating. Let's have a little look at that. Electric radiant. So I've got a few pictures there. Um, you'll see the things like chandelier heaters, where we've got some, um, what, basically you've got two types, those that glow and those that do not. Here are some pictures of those that glow. And on the um, right hand side are here are some that do not. Um, the ones that glow basically, um, will um, cast their warming glow further than the ones that do not. So you need to get them quite close. So advantages, relatively low cost, quite efficient. They don't heat the fabric, but they do heat what they hit in the radiation terms. They're flexible. Um, the mounting height is quite flexible on the radiant types. The effect diminishes with distance. You can mix and match, you can add to it, you can work it with PV. Hot head, cold feet is quite an issue. And appearance can be a heritage issue depending on the view of the diocese. The radiant far type, efficient, relatively low cost again, but you do need to get them close to people. So carbon impact, well, if you're true green, it's quite low. And, and these, these systems really do have their uses in churches. Um, and 
can be a, a, a good interim um, solution where a longer term carbon system is, is not currently affordable as well. People heating, getting people to where heating are. So here we are, um, the heated cushion. I don't think they used anything like as much as they should be. Um, this, they're used extensively on the continent. You sit on them and, oh, sorry about that. Um, you sit on them and the heat comes. So they're incredibly efficient. They only heat when people are sitting on them. Carpets and platforms are available, could be a bit of trip issue and a very popular and generally quite welcome solutions under pew heating so where you've got pews you've got some um good solutions for people heating this is harder if you haven't got pews of course and this is where when you're thinking about the future if you are going to remove your pews these solutions will not work for you so cushions here we go a summary adds to comfort um, can be added to as funding becomes available, mix and match, but it doesn't warm the air of fabric, so you might get a cold nose and hands there. Um, under pew heaters, again, same and platform and carpet, but you've got to watch out for trip hazards. Not often used in the UK, but again, um, they are available to you. So what else have we got? Other electric sources? Well, we've got some night storage heaters again. I'm not going to, these are just our, our um, set of heaters that deliver electric heating into a space and they, they can be very useful in a whole load of ways. Um, a quick word on night storage. Um, night storage can be used with controls to extend um, an electrical capacity problem. So you can heat your night storage up at night when you're not using anything else and turn it off during the day and get some heat out of it. And that can be useful um, for um, where you've got very, very limited capacity. And you can get it on a lower cost night tariff as well, of course. Warm air. So um, this is where we're blowing hot air from a source. Um, obviously we talked about air to air heat pumps before, which are technically hot air, but most you'll encounter are the middle picture there, which is a big unit, which has a burner in it of some sort, gas or oil, and it delivers warm air. So direct, direct means that the flu gases go into the space. We don't do that anymore or not very often anyway. You don't really want to be doing that. If you've got a direct system and your maintenance contractor will tell you, you need to be thinking really about getting that out. We don't want people breathing gases, that um, combustion gases. They can be noisy. You can get um, a high heat loss and stratification with them. Um, but they can have their uses again. If you can get them, um, for example, into a floor duct, it can be quite a good solution. And so an indirect gas system could be an, an interim solution, but it's not a long-term solution. We are going to really have to think about doing something different in, in these, unless we can um, do some clever engineering, which we can do, where our heating comes from a heat pump um, our warm air systems are, are probably going to become fewer and fewer in number. Well, I've talked about air to air heat pumps, so I'm not going to um, go any more into that. And last but not least is our wet system. So these are the things we are most familiar with. This is our radiator and its mates, basically. And radiators are great things. They come in all shapes and sizes. Cast iron radiators we can reuse. They can be restored. They warm up slowly, but they cool down slowly too. So I hear a lot of people say, you know, my radiator isn't efficient. Your radiator can be efficient. It depends what you do with it, but um, it can be compatible. Um, obviously a radiator that heats up very fast, um, which is a steel type. Um, is, is something that, that can be used less gas, but not necessarily, it depends on the application. So 
where we've got um, heritage issues, a flat panel radiator can be a very good thing because you can paint it to match a stone wall. It can be quite unobtrusive. I'm not the world's biggest fan of casing, if I'm honest, because it quite often um, traps the heat in the casing and it'd be quite difficult to get out. But they can be, the, the, again, there can be solutions. I don't particularly like casing radiators in them, but it is possible. And we've got some trench heating there. Uh, it can be neat, but it can also collect an awful lot of dust and debris and, and people's heels um, can get stuck in it as well. We've always got to think about where pipe work will run. And then our fan convector, which works off our wet system, um, delivers, and they're getting increasingly popular because they can, they're very flexible. They don't take up much wall space and they can deliver a huge amount of heat for not a lot of cost or um, uh, equipment. So they can be lowish first cost and quite efficient. So in summary, um, or summarise in a minute. Um, so we'll come to the summary in a minute, but there are our fan convectors. They can be noisy, um, but they can be selected so they're not too noisy as well, particularly if we've got speech reinforcement in some way, shape or form. Underfloor heating, I'm going to take just a minute to go through this one. Probably one of the most common questions I get asked, is underfloor heating suitable? Well, it depends. It needs to be on all or most of the time. It warms up very, very slowly, but it can cool down quite quickly. If you um, open your doors, you can lose a lot of your heat and it can be very difficult to get it back up again. It's best used in a well insulated space. That's not to say you can't use it in a church. If your church is being used during the week and you are using that whole space during the week. My rule of thumb, it's a crude one, but it's five, it's five days a week at least. Um, and that's the only space you're using for the majority of the time. Yes, underfloor heating can be a really good source, but you do need to insulate underneath it. You need to really pay some attention to the reducing demand Otherwise you'll find you don't get warm enough or you have to put supplementary heating in as well. Another big question, is the floor historic? Because you will be covering it up or digging it up. And are the burials and archeology archeological remains because you will be sealing them off? And what is your heat source for it? Really could do with being um, a low carbon one. I know I could do a whole um, seminar on the, the sole topic of underfloor heating, so I'm aware I've given it a pretty short shrift, but um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions on it. But it is quite a big topic, and I would always say get specialist advice if you're thinking about it. Don't get too carried away by the appearance of it, which is fabulous, but not necessarily. Right then, to sum up on our wet systems, fan convectors, incredibly um, very compact, radiators, incredibly flexible, trench heating, niche really, underfloor, well, it depends, um, don't discount. Um, controls, they need to be easy and intuitive, they need to be responsive, they need to turn on and off. I'm a great fan of the, um, the internet enabled um, controller. So your poor church warden does not have to go in um, at four o'clock in the morning to turn the heating on. Um, zoning, can we small eat heat smaller areas? And can we make sure please that we don't freeze our building or our pipes? So I'm conscious I've run on a little bit, but here it is. Start with a long list of options. Eliminate the impossible to follow Sherlock Holmes, assess the suitability of the rest, and get your facts together, your cost, carbon, and running cost. Not just cost and running cost, carbon too. What's the carbon impact? So short list, get budget costs, seek advice, seek funding. Look at the whole life cost and carbon if you can. So multiply it over the number of years you'd like to have the system capital cost, fuel and carbon, and 
what is what is the life bar equipment of the equipment that you could be thinking about putting in you've got more questions than answers well you know it that's what we're here for um, and that's what we try and do um, either the GAC advisor or a building services engineer will help you out but as an informed client which hopefully you you are now you can ask the right questions and remember one size does not fit all and with that i hand back to Catherine. Thank you so much Susan there's so much to cover isn't there um there have been a lot of questions you won't be surprised to hear uh, do you want to stop sharing your screen and then and then we'll become bigger um the first question and the second and about the fifth and the seventh so between them they add up to a lot of votes are about funding i know that funding isn't isn't your lead thing um if I, i'll put two links in the chat one of which is to our trusts directory and one of which is to the community energy england guide to funding opportunities so those will appear in the chat in a second susan have you got any wise words from churches that you've worked with and where they found the funding most Mostly from other projects, mostly on the back of a community project that is doing something else and the heating can be um, linked to the back of it. Not very, very, very little that is in pure carbon terms. Um, there is, of course, um, potentially, and we're not quite sure it's going to work, but there's potentially going to be the green grant as well. But um, the vast majority of ever heating replacements. Sorry. If it will be pricking up at that, you might need to explain to them what the clean heat grant's expected to cover. Well, it's expected to cover, we think, the first 4,000, um, but they've pulled the, um, they've just pulled the domestic one. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> the, 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 they've just got rid of the, um, they've pulled the one in because they couldn't get the installers. So I, I just hope that at some point in the near future um, we can have a bit more clarity on um, how the policy is going to play out. Covid has, I think, probably um, snarled a lot of government departments. I wish I could tell you. Yeah, but the speculation is a £4,000 grant which would go towards heat pumps and biomass, if I remember yeah. rightly. Um, and it was, it was meant to be announced now-ish and hasn't been to begin, I think, next year. So we're we are awaiting government announcements on that. Um, I have just in the last few days agreed dates for uh, webinars specifically on fundraising for environmental projects. I'm afraid they're not till the 7th and the 9th of September. The dates will go on our website in the next few days. So I know that people want webinars just on fundraising and I have got them booked and arranged and they're coming just after the summer. Um, the next question really touches on that last slide that you had about where people can get advice from. So the particular question is trying to get advice about far infrared electric heating panels. Are they suitable? Uh, what would the cost be? But I think there's a general question there about where people, people can seek good, reliable advice. Yes, so number one, port of call, if you've got one, somebody like me, um, we inevitably a bit rationed, um, as the truth be known, because we don't we do this for the love of it. Um, but if you've got a heating advisor, use them. Um, there's uh, I've got a, an excellent electrical counterpart as well, um, who I very often bring in to um, to advise on electrical capacity when we're looking at things like heat pumps. So we're we're, we're quite um, well off in Worcester. Um, other dioceses I know haven't got the same, um, necessarily the same coverage, but if you've got one, a heating advisor, secondly, um, is um, a building services professional, um, which you would have to pay for, of course. Um, I'm not saying that, um, I'm not saying that heating contractors um, or uh, manufacturing suppliers cannot provide good advice. They provide the best advice about their product, the, the suppliers. And, and so, um, you know, for example, with the FAR product, um, the, the supplier will tell you that they don't work very well if you put them too far away. They will tell you that. And, and that's good advice. Um, 
you know, and there are some, you know, that you, you saw, if you look at some of those slides I've given you that are attributed to um, suppliers, I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not here to sell suppliers and I've got no connection whatsoever with any of them. Um, but they can, you know, if you've decided this is what you want, they will give you good advice on their product, of course. Trusted heating contractors um, can give you, again, good, good advice about the detail of the system. Uh, but less so probably about what to choose in the first place. So that's where, where a professional um, may come in. It may be obvious, of course, um, but it's, you know, where, where it's less obvious. And I would always recommend, um, you know, use some of these roadmaps I've given you, use some of these tables to start making your own decisions to think about, well, that's definitely not suitable for us, but this could be. So the, the expert client, is, is um, will get a long way. And you might find that you can go from being an expert client to a contractor without too much in between on, in a lot of cases. Um, uh, so, so that's useful, um, I think, um, where advice is, is, is coming from. I know it can be short sighted. Beware the hobby horse is all I'd say. Beware the, um, the person that's pushing um, wherever they come from, where they're pushing one thing above all else. I've put in the chat the link, if you don't already have it to your local DAC, I put a link to the DAC map so you can contact your local diocese and say what is available locally. And I've also put a link through to the SIBSI directory for building services engineers. Um, I'm conscious it's one o'clock. Are you able to hang on for just a few more minutes, Susan, and answer some more questions or do you need to be? Oh, absolutely fine. The only thing that's waiting for me is a sandwich. <laughs> um, right, we've just answered that one. Next, oh, funding. Funding again. I completely agree, but I think we've probably said what we can on funding in this context. Um, so I'm going to mark that one as done. Heat reflective mesh. I've heard that sometimes a heat reflective mesh is used in high ceilinged buildings to reflect the heat downward. Does anyone have any experience of this in a church? I haven't even heard of it, I'm afraid to say. No, I can't say I've, uh, I've done it. I get asked quite often about will the putting a suspended ceiling in help? Um, obviously, um, well, yes, it would, but it wouldn't be acceptable in most instances um, within a, certainly within a listed um, context. But um, as a rule, the less heat, the less space you heat, the better. So if you can reduce the, you know, certainly a, a, a church hall, could benefit from an insulated ceiling if you can't insulate the roof and it could potentially be quite a, a cheap and cheerful thing to do so the less volume you heat yeah um that that could be but heat reflective mesh per se no but i will research it um the next question is a oh they were flicking backwards and forwards uh the next one is a really important question actually so it's from a church which have put in a new oil-fired boiler only last year. Our PCC is horrified by the thought of replacing it by 2030. What can we do? Well, you don't have to replace it by 2030 per se, um, although you might feel that you want to. Um, but you know, um, the service life of an oil boiler is only 12 to 15 years anyway. So um, you will be replacing it in the 2030s anyway. I think I said before, um, heating plant does not last um, quite as long as the old stuff does. Um, depending on the type of boiler, most of them have got burners on the front. Um, so you can replace burners without replacing the, the entire boiler, but it just depends what, what is going to be available. Again, we're so uncertain. The off-tech will say that um, biofuels coming in. Um, so if you look at the off-tech website, it will, it will give you lots of encouraging um, noises about biofuels. But again, we, we don't know, it's not reliable. If we get a big network of, um, of biofuel that can take in waste oils, that can take in, um, sustainable sources, and I really, this is, I, I don't need, I, such a big topic, but sustainable sources of biofuel. Currently, um, the biofuel um, out there is 
um, some of it's coming from palm oil and palm oil is causing destruction, deforestation. So we have to be incredibly careful here. Um, we don't currently have a, a very robust sustainable standard for biofuel. So again, it, I could talk for half an hour on this topic. So it's, you, you need to plan for doing something for sure. What? I wish I could tell you um, right now, <laughs> and I can't. Given the embodied carbon that's gone into putting in a new heating system, I always think once you've got something, you want to make it last as long as possible, really. Um, so with that circumstance, presumably a lot of it is getting back to the very beginning of your presentation about using it efficiently. So looking at fixing the broken windows, dealing with the drafts, so that actually you're running, you're only running your old oil fire boiling when you really need it. Absolutely. And that's number one principle. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you could look at biofuel sources, sustainable biofuel sources. That's the, that's the other thing. Most burners can be adapted to run on a range of different fuels. So without even replacing it. Embodied carbon um, and it's uh, where operational carbon um, takes over from it is a complex subject because it, it all depends on how much you're using. But if you're using it infrequently, your embodied carbon, as you say, um, Catherine, it, it depends. I mean, if you're using it seven days a week, the operational carbon emissions will take over quite quickly. If it's only been used once or twice a week, it won't. So it's... Yeah. And, and it's so dependent. If you're only using your church a few hours a week, your carbon footprint's already going to be very low. So actually, if you can do your basic maintenance, make sure you're not wasting any of your heating, then at the end of the year, offsetting the small residue that you have, your carbon footprint's probably low. It's hard to tell from the question, not knowing the nature of your church. Uh, right, how are we doing? 106, let's take one more question. Um, oh, this one's about stratification fans. That's sort of linked, but linked, but different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, the jury's out on this one. I, my own opinion is they're of limited effectiveness um, because all, all um, if you ever study the forces of buoyancy, they tend to um, blow down maybe a couple of meter or two, and then it goes straight back up again, um, and you end up with noise and cost that doesn't achieve very much. Other engineers kind of swear by them. Um, I, I, I'm not keen if I'm honest. Um, I've yet to see an example of where they've worked wonderfully. If somebody's got, if somebody out there has got um, somewhere where it works wonderfully, you know, let us know because um, if it's made a really big difference and it's cut your heating bills and you're happy with them, great. But um, they're one of those things that seem to work intuitively, but not necessarily in practice. They work quite well in factories um, where you've got blown warm air heating um, and you're blowing it and, and that's at high level and you're blowing it further down. They kind of work quite well with unit heaters um, and they can save some energy, but also they're not really trying to get people are, they're not trying to get comfort to where people are seated and nobody really cares much about the noise either. So I, I know that that's a real sitting on the fence answer for which I apologise. Um, there are questions left, but I don't think I should keep people any longer. You've been very generous with your time, Susan. Um, do thank you everyone that's, that's come along. There's been a lot of links in the chat, so I'll save the chat before we finish and I'll put those links in the email that I'll send you. Susan, would you be able to send me your slides uh, that I can then circulate to people later today? Um, and look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Bye. So, thanks, everybody. Thanks for, for everybody for listening. So hope it's been useful.